Our subject of the morning is, you're invited to a wedding. And we have a text today, at least it's a verse that constitutes a point of departure. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. We are fast approaching the month in which more marriages are performed than any other two months out of the year. It's long been known that the month of June is the month in which to get married. The June bride is proverbial. The chances are that most of you this morning have an invitation in June to a wedding. Some of you may intend to get married. Many of you were married in June. Come to think of it, I was married in June, and I better not forget June the 10th either. <laughs> you will soon be hearing Lohengrin's Wedding March. A new organist in a church was having a wedding on a Saturday night, and he got his music mixed up. He did all right for the wedding march as they came in, but when they went out, he played The Fight Is On. <laughs> a young couple was standing before a preacher, and the preacher said to the young man, Wilt thou take this woman to be thy lawful wedded wife? And he said, I wilt. May I say to you, we're coming to a month that speaks to us of weddings, and therefore it's appropriate today that we consider the marriage in Cana of Galilee. There are three introductory statements that we'd like to make about this incident this morning that are very important. The first one is this, that the Lord Jesus Christ began his public ministry at a wedding. May I say to you that that is important and it's profound, and it seems passing strange. Why didn't he begin at Jerusalem, the religious capital of the world? Why didn't he go to the temple to begin his public ministry? Or, even better, why didn't he go to Rome, the power capital and the political capital of the world of that day? Or why not go to Corinth, the great commercial center of the day? Why begin in Cana of Galilee at this wedding? May I say to you, my beloved, he came from heaven's glory, and he began at a wedding of two unknown and poor peasants yonder in Cana of Galilee. But if we stand back this morning and get a correct perspective of then the sweep of the entire picture, I think we'll understand it. You go back to the very beginning. Marriage was the first institution that God made for man. And it was none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself that brought the first woman to the first man. He introduced them, and he performed the marriage ceremony for them and made them one. And then, my beloved, I look into the future, and I see that there's coming a day when that is to be the marriage supper of the Lamb. And at that marriage supper of the Lamb, Jesus is there and his disciples also, but they are there in a different capacity. Now he's the bridegroom, and his disciples, the church, that's the bride. And the psalmist says, the queen is there in the gold of Ophir, and John says, the bride has made herself ready that she is clothed in fine linen, and the fine linen is the righteousnesses of saints. My beloved, 
It's therefore in keeping that our Lord should go yonder to a wedding in Cana of Galilee and begin his ministry. There he went, and he put his seal of approval upon it. He put his blessing upon it. He said there, in fact, marriage is honorable. This is the thing God has instituted. And he was there, my beloved, by his very presence to say, This is ordained of God. Therefore, my beloved, it's important to notice he began his ministry at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. There is a second introductory matter that I wish we didn't have to deal with it, but I find we do today, and that's the wine. We're living in a day when I can't get around the question. On my question and answer program on this station every Monday night at 9, I'm having a great time with the WCTU on this incident here. I've enjoyed the very interesting back and forth that I've had with that group. May I say to you this morning that I think that we've misunderstood this parable altogether. I wonder if I might read to you the tenth verse and then give you a much better translation. And saith unto him, this is the governor of the feast, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. Dr. William Hendrickson, in a new and scholarly work on the Gospel of John, gives us this translation, which is his own and I think the finest. Listen to this. So he called the bridegroom, the governor of the feast, and said to him, Everybody serves the good wine first when men have drunk freely, not have become drunk, friends. Notice that. When men have drunk freely, they serve the wine of inferior quality. But you have kept the good wine until now. That's Dr. Hendrickson's translation of it. Now, my beloved, may I say to you that it's not a question here of the wine being intoxicating. If you are going off on that kind of a tangent and want to debate that, you've missed the point and the beauty of this incident here. You see, we take our thought patterns and we put them down on this incident, and that conditions our interpretation of the passage. If we attempt this morning to place our contemporary society down on Palestine of the first century, why, my beloved, we'll miss the point. May I say this to you, that the problem of drunkenness was not the sin of Palestine. It is the sin of Los Angeles, and it's the sin of America tonight. We're becoming a drunken nation. But may I say to you, that was not the problem here at all, and that's not being dealt with here at all. It's not a question of getting drunk. These people had no thought of that whatsoever, regardless of what you might think of the wine that was made. They were not drinking for that purpose. These were not Americans. They weren't civilized as we are today. These are first century folk. They haven't learned how to drink until they get drunk, my beloved. It wasn't done in polite society in that day, and you may be sure they didn't do that. Now, if you think Christ was making the kind of wine that bears the label of Roma, or Christian brothers, you are misreading this passage altogether. I say this reverently, but you have missed this. If you think that he's a heavenly bartender mixing drinks, that's blasphemous to think that. It's utterly ridiculous to try and fit this scene into our modern life today. He's no more teaching here the problem of drunkenness or the problem of alcohol any more than he is in the feeding of the 5,000. Now, the governor of the feast I always thought for years that he was sort of like the best man at a wedding. Actually, not so much like the best man, but like a toastmaster to banquet. 
And you know the requirement for a Toastmaster is to have a lot of bum jokes and to be able to dish out a great deal of corn. I know I've been Toastmaster. And my beloved, may I say to you, this was a corny expression on his part to begin with. He had to have something to say, and he came and listened to this again. So he called the bridegroom and said to him, Everybody serves the good wine first. Complimentary, you see. When men have drunk freely, they haven't become drunk. They serve the wine of inferior quality. But you have kept the good wine until now. And so, my beloved, there is no question in this about drunkenness. And there's no question in this at all. If we can just remove that from our thinking today and get down to the great teaching that shares the beauty of this passage, you may be sure that our Lord, you may be sure that the Scripture condemns drunkenness and nowhere will it condone. Now, the third item of introductory matter that we need to look at is this. Let me read our text. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. I break off there. The Roman Church teaches that Christ performed childhood miracles. Now, they get this from tradition. Of course, they do not get it from Scripture, and they put down on tradition the seal of the Church, which, according to them, makes it all right. But may I say to you, it's not in the Word of God. In fact, this answers the question. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. This is his first. So that when I read in tradition that the Lord Jesus, when he was a little boy down in Egypt, he was playing with other little boys, and they made clay pigeons, and then he touched them and they flew away. I know that that is something that is just pulled out of sheer imagination. There's no ground for that at all, and the Scripture says, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. This is the first miracle that he performed. Now, with that out of the way, we are ready for our text today. Will you look at it with me again in its fullness? This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Now, I ask the question very reverently this morning, but I'd like to ask it. How did the Lord Jesus show forth his glory in this miracle, this first miracle which he performed? I have several suggestions this morning, and you can add to them, of course. The first one is this. In this miracle, we see the glory of the commonplace in the Christian life. My beloved, in this miracle, you see the glory of the commonplace in the Christian life. Now, will you notice this? There's a fallacy today in the thinking of many of us relative to the Christian life. We have a notion today that if you become a Christian or if you live the Christian life, it must be spectacular. It must be something that's sensational. The spotlight must be upon you. You must live it under clay lights. You must have the flash bulbs going off all around you, and that it's filled with glitter and glamour, and that that today is the Christian life. Now, my beloved, may I say to you that this incident at the very beginning of the ministry of our Lord answers that. Then there are others today, they hold to a pious view. They think the Christian life is an austere and rigorous and restrained life, that the men who live for God are always stern and silent and solitary and somber, that if you're going to live for God, you must be utterly detached from the daily pursuits of life. You must be like John the Baptist, that man who went out yonder in the desert, lived alone, and speak out with fire for God. You must forsake home and loved ones. You must go off somewhere. You've got to leave Los Angeles before you can serve God today. Many of you know that even in the missionary conference, 
I've tried to get over this tremendous truth that you can live for God in Los Angeles at the workbench, in the office, on the campus, down the street, and in the home. And my friend, if you can't live it there, you can't cross an ocean and live it. And that God today needs ministers and missionaries, it's true, but God also needs lawyers today and doctors and engineers and barbers and bookkeepers. And that, my friend, you can live the Christian life today down in the commonplace. The Christian is in the world, but he's not of the world. The Lord Jesus says we're salt in the world. My beloved, salt that's up on the shelf is no good. It needs to be put down where life is and sprinkled there. He said that we are the light of the world, and a light that's hid under a bushel is no good. You put the light at the crossroads of life so men can see. My beloved, we need to realize that there is the glory today in the commonplace. Have you ever noticed our blessed Lord? He spent his life not in the desert, but in the home. He grew up in Nazareth. And when he came, he came eating and drinking. He moved freely in society. He moved from the home to the marketplace, into the street, out on the byways, and would even walk through Samaria, my beloved. Oh, we don't have to become a minister or a missionary, and we don't have to withdraw from society, and we don't have to be this extreme view today of separation and never touch humanity today, my beloved. We're in the world, but not of the world. And the Lord Jesus Christ began his ministry by going over a hill. Oh, I don't know whether it was three miles to the east or whether it was seven miles to the north. There's a question about what Cana it was in Galilee. There were several, but it doesn't make any difference which one it was. He went over the hill to a wedding, my beloved. Listen to this. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the wedding. He just went over the hill to this wedding, invited there, and that's where he began his ministry. His disciples went with him. At this time, if we're to judge from the first chapter of John, he had only six of them. There was James and John. There was Andrew and Peter. There was Philip and Nathaniel, and they were the only six with him. But if you notice, it was that same crowd, including Thomas, that you find at the very end of the Gospel of John, after his resurrection, that went fishing together. They are the problem children. And he took them with him to the wedding here. Here they go along, this group that need to see his glory in order that they might believe in him. And so he went. And who's getting married? Well, I can't make out from the invitation. I do not know who they are. Friends, I think, of the family. Mary apparently was helping. Names? John didn't mention the names. And this is one of the most unusual weddings I've ever seen. The bride isn't even mentioned. I hope she's there. But she's not mentioned, and you don't know what she wore. May I say to you, my beloved... This is an unusual affair, but it's so lovely. Our Lord got an invitation, and these unknown poor peasants, and he just goes over the hill to the wedding, and he begins his ministry in that particular place, my beloved. Will you notice this? And when they wanted wine... The mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. That's not a home in which you have a picture of plenty. It's a home of penury and poverty, and they're pinched folk. You'd think that for the wedding they would have been able to 
get together all they needed. That's the time when you, if you're going to put your good foot forward, you put it forward when the daughter in the house gets married, but not here. They ran out of wine. They're poor folks. And Mary made this request of the Lord Jesus. What does she mean? She came to him and says, they have no wine. And I must confess to you that if that's all I had, I wouldn't understand at all what she meant. But I do understand in his response. Will you listen to it? Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. It's not a harsh answer that he gives. What he's saying is this. And what she had in mind was this. She comes to him yonder at this wedding, and how appropriate it was at a wedding. You see, in that neighborhood, there was a question about his birth. Mary said he was virgin-born. Joseph said he was a virgin-born. And there were some people in that neighborhood that didn't believe it. And the psalmist in the 67th Psalm says it was the drunkards that didn't believe it. Today they are ministers and college professors. I have here in my hand the book that is causing a great deal of stir in theological circles right now, Nels Ferrer's book, The Sun and the Umbrella. This is the man that said that Jesus was born of Mary and a German soldier stationed in that area. May I say that that's the lowest thing that's ever been said about him. I consider him a blasphemer. And yet many of your denominational boards are recommending that book and many are studying it today. I'll tell you what Mary is saying. Mary is saying, now is your opportunity. I've been saying all along that you're virgin-born, that you're the Son of God. I've been saying that the day would come when you would demonstrate that you are the Son of God and you'll clear my name. And he says, mine hour hasn't yet come. It's not time. And it won't come until his resurrection. I think it's lovely to find in the book of Acts that Mary was yonder with the disciples after his resurrection. After his ascension, it says Mary was there, and I can see her there now. There she sits, and she says, I told you, John, he was virgin born. He's declared to be the Son of God with power by his resurrection from the dead. This man's wrong. He wasn't there to begin with. The Lord Jesus says to her, Mine hour hasn't come. You'll have to wait. Oh, but she knew him. Well, she knew him somewhat, and she says here, she says, Whatever he says to you, why you do it? And he did it. <laughs> You know, it's interesting, he would not turn stones into bread to please the devil, but to relieve the embarrassment of a young couple that were getting married, he'll turn water into wine. How lovely. How gracious he is. And when he went there, it put a glory on the commonplace, my beloved. And then I see something else here. How did he reveal his glory? Well, he revealed the glory that's in nature. We lose sight of that today. I want you to notice this. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And believe me, if you're going to listen to Mary, don't pray to her, but listen to her advice here. She says, whatever he says, you do it. That's good advice. And it's the advice of a mother. I drop by verse 6 because I'm coming back there, but notice verse 7. Jesus saith unto them, 
fill the water pots with water, and they fill them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bride. Now, my beloved, I want you to notice this here. It's a real miracle. There's no other explanation for this one. I have gone over quite carefully what the liberal has said here, and I intended to mention it today, but he hasn't said anything worthwhile that is even worth answering in answer to this. This is a clear case of a miracle. There's no hocus-pocus here. He didn't touch anything. He didn't have to put his hand on something, and it was not necessary even put your hand on the radio to make contact. He just did. It was a real, genuine miracle, my beloved. As it was drawn out, it turned to wine. And as Milton put it in that lovely way, the conscious water saw its Lord and blushed. What a beautiful thing, my beloved. We take for granted the process that's going on around us today in nature. Out yonder in the natural world today, it's gradual and slow and long drawn out, but it's just as miraculous. Right now, up here in the San Joaquin Valley, vineyard after vineyard, mile upon mile of them, row upon row of them, and grapevine after grapevine. And do you know a miracle is taking place? Oh, biochemistry can come in and tell you the process, but they haven't explained anything. May I say to you, my beloved, that yonder is a miracle taking place and it's taking place gradually, water is being turned into wine. And today we've become blinded in our city life, and we no longer see the beauties and glories that's in nature today. You remember Dr. G. Camel Morgan years ago? He was walking in a garden of a new convert in England. And as they walked through the garden, this new convert stopped and picked up a lovely rose that was bending over and held its face up and looked at it and made this statement. He says, you know, I see a beauty in this rose I never saw till I became a Christian. May I say to you this morning, my beloved, when you're a child of God, you will see a beauty that you've never seen before in nature round about you. And tomorrow, when you are driving out for the holiday, saying, Open my eyes that I may see wonders of beauty thou hast for me. His first miracle, water into wine. The first miracle of the Bible performed by Moses, water into blood. Now this one, who represents grace and truth, he changes and transforms water into that which is the symbol of joy and life and not death. Oh, the glory there is in nature. And then, my beloved, there is a third glory that there is in this incident by which he revealed himself, the glory of the reality of the Christian faith. Now shall we read verse 6. And there was set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. I want you to look at those water pots. I can't tell you what the bride wore, but I can tell you about these water pots. These old water pots, they tell a story. They were battered, and they had been tucked away somewhere for the wedding. What were they doing there? Well, they tell a story. They tell the story that, that back of these water pots there is indicated that they belong to a religious family after the manner of the purifying of the Jews. You know, the nation Israel had a superstitious dread at this time of uncleanliness, and they washed everything. 
They were afraid they'd be contaminated by the least bit of dirt, and they kept large supplies of water on hand. Listen to Mark in the seventh chapter, the third and fourth verses. Let me read this. For the Pharisees and all the Jews, except they wash their hands off, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they've received to hold as the washing of cups and pots, brazen vessels and of tables. So each one of these pots would hold about 25 gallons, and they were there for the purifying of the Jews. Those water pots, they speak of the externalities of religion. They speak of that which goes on on the outside. Why, the Talmud says the washing of kitchen utensils went on all day. It was a religious and ceremonial service. They substituted these externalities for the realities, and they lost sight of the great spiritual message that God had given when he had given them many of these things that pertain to ceremonial cleansing, although he never gave them quite as much as they were practicing. But my beloved... I'm not amazed yonder at these men, because today, even in our day, men have substituted the externalities of religion for the realities today. Men still make these things important. They say you must go through this ceremony, you must do this, and you must refrain from doing something else. I wonder if you've noticed what Paul says. In 1 Corinthians 8, 8, But meat commendeth not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. My beloved, today there are those that say that if you eat this or you don't eat that, if you go through this ceremony or you don't go through that ceremony, today our Lord Jesus had said it's not what goes into the man, it's what comes out of the man and that the reality is what's in the heart and not what goes into his stomach at all. I think of those verses back yonder when the Lord said back in the psalmist, Thy love is better than wine. And the Lord Jesus says, Whoso drinketh my blood has everlasting life. My friend, it's not washing the outside today. It's the inward work of the Spirit of God in the heart today, His work of grace in the human heart. It's not washing with water today that's important. It's being washed by the precious blood of Christ. It's not outward cleanliness, but it's holiness of life, my beloved. It's not the clothes we wear, but it's whether we have that robe of righteousness which is God's robe of righteousness he gives to those that trust Jesus Christ. My friend, it's the transforming power of God in the human heart that's important today, and that'll manifest itself on the outside. Will you notice this? Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they fill them up to the brim. Oh, what a picture that is today. A picture, my beloved, of every Christian as they ought to be. He began with empty water pots. And one of the reasons today he can't fill us, we're so filled with other things. We're told to be filled with the Spirit, but how can you fill a vessel when it's already full of other things? We must start with him empty. We must come to him. And after all, consecration never meant anything in the world, in the Scripture, except to come to God with empty hands and let him fill those hands. And he took those empty water pots and he filled them. In my reading this past week, I came across this statement of Spurgeon. And it's so pertinent, I wonder if you'd forgive me if I read what Charles H. Spurgeon said to another generation. He says, you must not take anything for granted between God and your soul. I charge you to make sure work here. Take your wealth for granted, if you like. Take the title deeds of your estate for granted, if you please. But between God and your soul, let everything be settled 
and straight and clear and sure and have no mistakes about the matter. Then he goes on to say this, it's so easy to have been under religious influence from our youth up and then go on year after year, never having raised the question whether we are Christians or not, saying to ourselves, of course it's all right. You will be much nearer the truth if you say, of course it's all wrong. You will be much more likely to come to an honest conclusion if you rather suspect yourself too much than believe in yourself too much. I'm sure that in speaking thus, I'm giving you sound preaching. My beloved, oh, the reality that there is in this first miracle of Christ Oh, today, is it real between you and God today? The glory of the reality of the Christian faith. And then lastly, and very briefly, we see in this the glory of God's gifts. And again, will you notice with me this translation of Dr. William Hendrickson of the 10th verse? So he called the bridegroom and said to him, Everybody serves the good wine first. When men have drunk freely, not have become drunk. They serve the wine of inferior quality, but you have kept the good wine until now. I love that. You know, friends, the devil always gives you his best first. And then it gets worse and worse. He always does that. Anything he has to do with, it's a head of gold to begin with, but feet of clay when you come to the end. And that's what happens when you serve him. The prodigal son lived riotously at first, had many friends, fair-weather friends, spent money liberally. But I tell you, the devil had a pig pen for him before he was through with him. The Lord Jesus says, wide is the gate. Broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. Straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth to life. We've misunderstood that because we think that to be a Christian you've got to be confined. And if you are going to live for the devil, it's wide open. That's not what the Lord Jesus said. He said that the opening is wide. But you see it keeps narrowing down because it leads to destruction. That's the devil's method. He gives you his best to begin with. He always does. The Chinese proverb, man takes a drink, the drink takes a drink, then the drink takes the man. That's the story of many of alcoholic today. He starts in and says, I can take it or let it alone. <laughs> you Christians, you don't touch it. <laughs> you narrow-minded people. But you go down here and look at some of these booze hounds on Main Street and ask them whether they can let it alone or not. It leadeth to destruction, my beloved. That's the subtlety of the devil. But straight is the gate, narrow is the way, and it leadeth to life. And the Lord Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And when you come to him, yes, it's narrow when you enter. Very narrow, very dogmatic. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Very not narrow, but it leads to life, my beloved. The pastures are beyond. The wages of sin is death. And Las Vegas is telling that story right now. That place that's become world famous, brassy and brazen exterior. It's glitter and it's glamour. Everybody going there. But may I say to you that, as a pastor, I never realized that it would come to my attention, but in the past couple of months, I have seen what it does. I had a dear lady that came and said, my husband, he makes good money, at least he did, he's been fired now. He became an alcoholic and bankrupt and spent everything he had in Las Vegas, and he always talked about it. 
He could quit it any time he wanted to, but she, with tears in her eyes, says he can't quit it today. Wages of sin is death. The devil gives you the best at first, but at last it stingeth like an adder, like a serpent. Another man talked to me. He said, I, I had to give those little wheels up. I was becoming a metal case. And if you ask me, he wasn't becoming a mental case, he is one. And then, my beloved, another that ended up in suicide when he lost everything he had, including his home. The wages of sin is death. But thank God, the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, and you always have the ascending scale of the value of God's gifts. He never gives you the best at first. Always he has the best for you later on. This governor here said, why, well, you've saved the best until last. Well, God always does that, my beloved. He saves the best until Why did you know heaven is yet to come? <laughs> heaven is yet to come. And if that wine in a poor peasant's cottage in Cana of Galilee was delicious, what about the new wine in the Father's kingdom when we sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb? The other Wednesday evening, a man I hadn't seen in some time came down, saved here five years ago, and just as a pleasantry, I said to him, well, how are things going? This was his answer. It gets better all the time. God always saves the best until the last. And I called him back and I said, Brother, if you think it's good here in Los Angeles, and I'm not so sure about that, but if you think it's good here in Los Angeles, think what it'll be when you get over there. God always saves the best. Until the last, he showed forth his glory at the first miracle yonder at a wedding in Cana of Galilee. Shall we pray?